Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Hey there, disturbed listeners. We're still working on disturbed number 200, but in the meantime, we wanted to share a favorite episode of the past. Stay tuned for the big number 200 episode coming September 19th. And hey, thanks. This content may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion advised. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away coming from the north. I listened well, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving toward the sound. We immediately started to walk away, and they tried to follow and grab us. At this point, we began to run. They got back into the van and followed us. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you three true tales and a listener voicemail that will frighten and disturb. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. Now this week, we're kicking off the show with a story from way back in the original days of Disturbed. Back then, it was narrated by myself. But now, you get to hear it from the talented Matt Bradford, coming to us from Reddit user Wilhelm Baudelaire, and we're confronted by the maniac in the forest. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I've never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still don't know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he is still where I saw him. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting university. Our home was, still is, just outside a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go to often as a child. I knew the forest there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. Now, it's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down, and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years, never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. 
As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving toward the sound. Yeah, I know, a stupid move, and I'd be the first person to die, but I was heading north anyway, so what the hell. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell. I could have been enclosed in a tin or something. And the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound, apart from the one obvious thing, which I didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person, but I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally. Until I found a badger, a blue and dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh, the body was still limp, and there wasn't much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, and so had I. So the badger was put there, or maybe killed there, at least decapitated, while I was walking that way. I suppose, but don't really know. And nothing else happened that day. But one week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and, well, the last time ever. I left home around 6 p.m. I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, and decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger with his head strung to his front paws. That part of him looked like a hand because of the way it was tied and just swinging from a tree like an almost literal load of bollocks. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus-textured fluid in my hair. I mean, it was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused felt like a bucket of cold ice water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd see it, so someone was watching me and running around the forest. Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream back towards the path for a while when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west, it was the closest part of the path to me, and to go as fast as he could and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I just shit out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raised despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I mean, I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. I mean, the fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flip and breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a goddamn horse coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path. She was saying that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bed. I was so terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing that half-running, half-speed-walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then, I heard branches break. Clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and the bell ringing louder. 
didn't want to look, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I fucking didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I mean, I lied. I said, I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path. Dad, can you see me? I'm here. I mean, I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me, but I kept telling myself not to look back. I was grasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck, and then they just switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name, and I knew he was coming my way and, and that he could see me because of the intonation in his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. Even my mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car and ready to leave fast. You're listening to Disturbed from Disturbed Media. Next up, we hear from Reddit user Underpants Bandit, featuring voice work by Sarah Thomas. And we're nearly taken out by the intruder. So this was May 2017. My husband Jim and I own a five-floor, hundred-year-old building which has our business in it, an antique mall. Our apartment's upstairs, and there are various other tenants. We had several back-to-back burglaries in the prior years and had reinforced the front doors of the business pretty intensely. Aggressive steel bars, more cameras, etc. Anyway, at 3 a.m., we were sound asleep upstairs, as one is, but then we got a call from Sonitrol, our security company. We had a motion detect in an unusual location, not the main floor where 90% of the jewelry is, but downstairs. That sort of thing is usually a spider on the camera or a mouse or some shit. So we ran out less than prepared. I was only wearing a tank top, undies, and flip-flops. Jim did not grab his baseball bat, but at least had on pants. I went one way to check the front door, which was intact, and Jim went the other to check around the back. Suddenly, he called me and said, someone's inside. So I fumbled with my phone trying to call 911. In that situation, your monkey brain is in the driver's seat, and the phone is the black monolith from 2001 Space Odyssey. Finally, I managed it and rounded the backside of the building, narrating to the 911 operator. Broken glass, broken window. I said, as I later heard during the run-up to the trial, oh my God, they're in there. Please come now. Then there was an unholy crash. It sounded like everything inside was being smashed to bits. The feeling of listening to someone busy destroying your livelihood is something I can't quite capture. Who was in there? How many? What path of destruction was being wreaked? I could only yell down the phone at a faceless voice, begging for help that I knew was still minutes away. Bear in mind, I was freshly awoken into a horrible situation barely clothed, and it was escalating by the second. As it turned out, the burglar, Troy, had come face to face with Jim, trying to exit the building out of the broken window before I'd arrived. They locked eyes and Troy said, oh shit, and reversed in direction back to the depths of the building. Then he dropped his backpack with stolen merch, flung himself bodily over a giant iron gate, smashed through the restaurant tenant's door, and then subsequently out their main door. At that point, he'd caught a lot of glass to the face and body and was bleeding pretty badly. Jim caught him on the exit and fucking pounced on him. Full body slammed to the cement. 
Then he pinned Troy. Adrenaline is wild. I was not crying, but urgently begging the operator to hurry, hurry, hurry. I was terrified I was going to see my husband die before my eyes. And then I ran right into the fray because, again, adrenaline. It gets right up on you and you just do the stupidest shit. They were in the middle of the street, dimly orange lit by the streetlights, and it was hard to parse out what was going on. Fucking thanks, sweet baby Jesus. Troy did not have a weapon and was wildly unprepared to have a madman tackle him in the dark. As it turned out, he had done hundreds of burglaries and never been caught. Jim had the upper hand and had him fully pinned down, and Troy was wisely playing possum. Suddenly, we heard a roaring engine and someone laying rubber. Apparently, I started screaming. Yeah, it was Troy's getaway driver, his wife, Kelsey. She leaned out her window and yelled, get the fuck off him or I'm gonna kill the bitch. That was me, the bitch, Simwa. Clearly captured on the audio, but I don't remember it. Not willing to wait, she then tried to run me over. I vaguely remember realizing things were going horribly wrong, but desperately trying to read the license plate into the phone with an idiotic laser focus. It was out of state and I struggled to read it. That's all. My brain deleted how close she'd come to turning me into a bloody smear. Within maybe a foot of me, fast, while I dodged like a badly clothed matador clutching my phone. We had to listen to the 911 recording a year later in the prosecutor's office, synced with the video. The video was from a nearby business with really good exterior cameras. Jim started crying. He had no idea what a close call it was. The engine revving overwhelmed my screaming at a certain point. My voice was blown out. I was trying to chant the license number like an incantation, but you can't hear it because the engine roar and squealing tires. Jim let Troy go, of course. Troy jumped into the car and they tore off down the street. The police showed up maybe a minute later, but they were gone. Anyway, Troy had bled all over Jim from the door glass. Jim freaked out so hard later. We figured Troy was likely using IV drugs, correctly, as it turned out, and I had to inspect Jim for cuts using a flashlight to make sure I missed nothing. He still got tested. Unlike a number of other incidents, this one was taken pretty seriously due to the amount of evidence as well as violence and, you know, the attempted murder. Several months later, they arrested Troy and Kelsey. They had Troy's DNA from the bloody clothes Jim was wearing and all over the car they'd been driving, which had been stolen but ditched. It turned out they were wanted in five counties for hundreds of commercial burglaries over the years to support their oxy habits. Back before the age of fentanyl, we were the only fuck up they made. They didn't know we lived on the premises. Kelsey, the wife, flipped on Troy. They accepted a plea for her, much to my displeasure since she was the one that tried to kill me. At least she ratted him out six ways to Sunday. He refused a plea. He wanted a trial. I would not wish a trial on my worst enemy. You get interviewed alone by the defense team. Did you know they can lie? They sure can. They won't in front of the jury, but one-on-one, -on -one, they'll eat your soul and pick their teeth with the shards. You don't get a lawyer. You're on team prosecution. Theoretically, I can understand it, but it's still utterly maddening. They took me first. They played the 911 tape, second time I'd heard it. They insisted that because I kept saying they're inside, that I was lying and there was someone else, not Troy or Kelsey. Sorry, I just use it as a non-gendered pronoun, guys. I hadn't yet seen the person, so they were a they, which is what I told them, adamantly. Then they took Jim. They told Jim that I admitted I'd lied and there was another person inside the building. He luckily laughed and was like, absolutely the fuck not, she didn't. Finally, the day before the trial, Troy accepted the plea. Thank God. I had been having the stupidest meltdown ever. Do I dye my hair something other than purple? I just spent $700 on it. What shoes do I wear? I don't have conservative shoes. How can I cover my tattoos? Basically the most pointless shit I could control because that train was rolling on without me. Kelsey got off with probation. Troy was in prison from 2017 to 2020 until he got released early adjacent to COVID. Kelsey seems to be clean and living a normal life, 
remarried with kids and looks happy. I watch her on Facebook. I really hope she is happy. I do occasionally wish she had a raging case of hemorrhoids or something though. I'm not a saint. You're listening to Disturbed. Now, back to the horror. Up next, we have a listener voicemail from Brittany, and she details an experience with what she believes to be a skinwalker. Hey, everyone. My name is Brittany McShane. I've never called into a podcast before, but I feel like this story is worthy of telling. I'm going to tell it the best I can, and it's still kind of reeling in my head on what the heck happened, so bear with me. It was last month, end of last month, that I got this crazy idea that I wanted to go ghost hunting in a cemetery. That's always been something that I love doing. Don't ask me why. It's just the rush is great. I'm new to the Pacific Northwest, I moved out here from Maui, Hawaii, so I'm still new to the land and, you know, your the history and just all of that stuff. So I'm just blindly coming in naive. And so one day, basically, I decided to drag my boyfriend, Jazz, with me uh, to go ghost hunting in a cemetery. I had my mindset on this one cemetery and it was in downtown Bellingham. It's known to be haunted and it just looks so beautiful. I was really drawn to it. However, we didn't have much gas and it's like 20 minutes away from where we're currently living now and it just didn't seem doable to go over there and then just have to come all the way back. So we decided to keep it local. We're currently staying in Birch Bay in Blaine which is, again, 20 minutes away from the location that I originally wanted to go to, to go ghost hunting. So because I don't know the area very well, I decided to do a Google search and see what type of, you know, cemeteries are out this way and give it a shot. So I'm Google searching and I find this one cemetery that's about eight minutes away from where we live. I thought, okay, cool, let's go to the cemetery. It's pretty close by. We'll just do a really quick one through, do some EVPs, explore, and then we'll come back to the house. So we pack up. It's not even midnight. I kid you not. It's probably around like 10, almost 11, maybe. I don't know, roughly around there. So it's dark outside. You obviously will need a flashlight and, you know, all that stuff. Perfect spooky vibe to go to a cemetery. And we're driving over there. Vibe felt fine driving over there. It didn't seem scary. It didn't seem ominous or anything like that. The cemetery was super small. You literally could walk in, do a circle, and then you'd be done. You'd see the entire cemetery. So I didn't think much of it. Quite honestly, I was disappointed. But we went anyway. So we're going through the gates to enter the cemetery. And of course, doing the typical asking questions The only light we had was our phone light, doing EVPs through that as well. So we're really just naively going in and just seeing if we can find anything. We go towards the back side of the cemetery and there was a lot of old tombstones there, but still relatively new. Mind you, again, this is like a very small cemetery, so it's not like huge or anything. So we're taking pictures, asking questions, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it started getting really cold. And mind you, yeah, it's September, getting to the cold, spooky season, but like, you shouldn't be seeing your breath. You shouldn't be feeling like you're walked into a freezer. It just, it's not realistic. And it just doesn't happen out of nowhere. Like, it's logically, that doesn't work like that. So we kind of, me and my boyfriend kind of marked it like we felt something and just kept that in mind that something was changing. I got pulled to the section, or we both basically did, got pulled to the side of the cemetery where there was a lot of older stones, but it just kept getting colder the more we got closer over there. So we kept that note, started asking questions. 
And the questions that we kept asking kept getting the breaks in between kept getting longer and longer because we weren't feeling comfortable at all. Out of nowhere, there was this rustle, which spooked us both. We got startled pretty quickly. And we looked like straight over to where there was like a bunch of trees, big, tall trees and like bushes and they're all thorny and everything. So if you were to go through that, you're definitely going to get cut up like they're blackberry bushes, you know, or raspberry bushes. And all of a sudden I noted to my boyfriend that, wow, I can really see my breath like it's there now. And as soon as I say those words, there is this high pitch out of this world, cackly scream. It kind of sounded like a monkey, but not. And it just was so terrifying. It would, it made your whole body stand, like all the hairs on your body stand up. It just didn't sound of this world. And I have shown my flashlight from my phone up to the bushes or up to the trees. And I swear there was this creature super long and super like, arms and legs were just like really long, could reach pretty far up. And mind you, these trees were cut down in the middle. Like, so you have to really try and get to the branch. You got to be like a giant to get up there, especially from the ground up. And those bushes like would have cut you. There's, there's no way. It just didn't look human, nor did it look animalistic. So we took off, we booked it. We kept running, and as me and my boyfriend are running to the entrance to get the hell out of there, he looked behind us, and he noticed that it had been chasing us through the trees, cackling continuously till we left the cemetery. As soon as we got to the car, long story short, we're freaked out. We head back to the house, and I decided that I'm going to do some research on what the heck this was that we saw if it was an animal or not and so basically I looked it up and to this day I wish I did this first but the website that I looked stuff up on said that there was a skinwalker basically it was Indian land that was donated to the church and the church took it over and used that as their burial ground so it had connections and ties to a lot of Native American stuff. So we didn't know that. It was completely like, it didn't look like that. So fast tracking forward to the next three days, I ended up getting sick. My boyfriend at work said that the dispensers where you get like sodas because he works at McDonald's, he saw it literally move, pick a soda, (laughs) push the button and all by itself, like there was nobody around. And then we had like just a string of bad events happen, like back to back to back. I saged the whole place, salt around our entire house for three days. And it it definitely lifted. But I am now a full blown believer of skinwalkers. I always used to think it was a joke. But now that I actually witnessed one and seen one, Yeah, my life has changed. So next time I go ghost hunting anywhere, I'm going to say a little prayer and I'm going to make sure that there's no skinwalkers around. And if there is, I'm going to be ready this time with protection. Get your voice on Disturbed with our hotline, available 24-7 completely free. Tell us your experience or just leave your comments on the show. Visit hotline.disturbedpodcast.com on your mobile device or computer. And we close out the show hearing from Reddit user Pale Instruction, featuring voice work by Tanya Eby and we narrowly avoid something terrifying. I never tell anyone this story, but reading all the stories on here, I feel like I need to post about it. Because of this, I don't go on walks alone or even with friends, unless it's in a very public place. But even then, 
I am paranoid. With that being said, my friend's family had just moved to a new town 15 minutes from where I lived. It was a complete ghost town with one tiny grocery store, a post office, and a school. This down was so secluded and quiet, I rarely ever saw cars drive by. One night, as we were unpacking boxes, we heard a knock at the door. It was a big, tall man with a shotgun in his hands. Being from Oklahoma, this could mean you're either meeting your hick new neighbor, or it's actually someone wanting to harm us. Turns out it was just a hick neighbor coming to introduce himself. He told my friend's mom about the lack of police, and how everyone tends to carry their own guns in order to protect themselves, because the police were usually no help and 15 minutes away. He also talked about how these areas can be dangerous, and that my friend's mom should keep a gun with her. At this time, I was 13 years old, and knowing this information, he would think I would simply stay my ass inside and not wander the streets of this dangerous hillbilly ghost town, but I did. There was no service, no cable, and nothing to do but go outside. We would walk to the store and get snacks, walk to the school and play on the playground. Majority of the time, we wouldn't see a single car or person, but the same clerk in the grocery store on every walk we took. There was a day my dad had brought me to her house, and right off the bat, we walked to the park. That day, I was sick to my stomach, but was so eager to go see my friend, I went anyways. I had a terrible feeling. And now that I'm older and have experienced bad anxiety, I can now say that day I was experiencing some pretty bad anxiety, and I didn't know why I felt this way. When we got there, we actually ended up hanging out with an old friend who had transferred to this school a year prior. After he left, we sat on the bench for what felt like ages, taking selfies and talking, when all of a sudden, the stereotypical creepy van pulls up to the park. Now, my friend was and still is way braver than I was and will ever be, and she was always the daredevil one in our friendship. But for some reason, around this time, I just assumed it was a family coming to play, and my anxiety was gone. But my friend was scared. She immediately had a bad feeling when the van pulled up, and I could tell she was ready to leave. But we decided to stay and see who it was before we just ran off. Of course, like something out of a movie came out two big men literally barreling over to where we were. We immediately started to walk away, and they tried to follow and grab us. At this point, we began to run. They got back into the van and followed us. I have no idea how, but they didn't catch up to us, but we ran as fast as we could up the road and straight to the grocery store. I was so horrified when we got inside, I couldn't even speak. That sick feeling I felt on the way to my friend's house made complete sense. My mom was always watching true crime growing up, and sometimes she would have me watch with her, so I was always really scared to walk around because of that. But even with that fear, I never thought it would never happen to me. The van was parked across the street, but eventually drove off. We walked home with no way to call anyone, thinking they could be waiting for us around every corner with absolutely no one around. It was the scariest day of my life. I didn't tell anyone for years, which was stupid of me, but at 13 years old, I didn't know what to do. I'm turning 21 soon, and this story still keeps me up at night sometimes. I can't help but imagine what would have happened if they captured me and my friend, where we would have gone, and what would have happened to us. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. A big shout out to our newest plus members, Katie Parsons, Jennifer Brown, and Heather Willoughby. If you enjoyed the show, please consider joining plus at disturbedpodcast.com slash plus for bonus episodes and ad free listening. But if you can't, you can leave us a positive rating and review on your favorite listening platform. Share your own true horror story at disturbedpodcast.com. Music by Carl Casey at whitebataudio and co.ag. And until next time, 
stay safe out there, y'all.